wake up. Good morning. Uh, would you pray with me as we can get our prayers this morning? Father God, we, we love you and we praise you. God, you are great and worthy to be praised this morning. Loving God, for each one who leads us in worship today, we pray that they may be filled with your spirit. That they will clearly reflect the glory of Christ in all they say and do. We pray that everyone in this place will know you, are with us, and be drawn to bring you all honor, glory, and praise. God, we also lift all the thousands of others who are gathering this morning um, together in community uh, to worship you. We pray that we are all filled with your Holy Spirit and that we focus all our attention on you this morning. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And if you would stand and join me this morning as we sing hymn number 328, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. <laughs>
somebody's moved this thing.
Give me a few ideas of where these equals are going to shoot. Did y'all hear that? From Oregon, Mississippi, to South Carolina, to uh, uh, Louisiana, they're going all out. Now, since a friend asked earlier in the week, he says, hey, can we bring my decoys in and pray over them? I thought, man, that's an awesome idea. For a church to come together and pray over a ministry. I don't know if you know it, but a lot of times when they do revivals, or they do camps. Somebody will go in and pray over every seat in that place. That once that seat is filled, that that person will hear the gospel. So what we're doing this morning is standing together in this moment and praying over these decoys that someone will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and has never heard it. And because they would never step forth in a church, maybe. But they could hear it in God's creation. That's the idea. Did I do a good job of explaining that? Okay. So, I'm asking you as a church, if you're willing to pray with us over these decoys and the ministry that is there, would you stand and join us in prayer? Put a hand on one. God, we thank you for a vision of a young man to share the gospel in a way that many others would never hear. Father, we pray for these decoys as they go out. As they decoy a dove, but yet allow the real message of Jesus Christ to be shared. Father, I pray for these as they travel, the many miles. I pray for those that will encounter these decoys. I pray for those who are have signed up for them. Give them the boldness that they need to share. Give them the the right words to say when the time is there. Father, we pray for those that will see these decoys and handle them and pick them up and put them out and realize, wow, God loves me. And Father, I pray for Brandon and his ministry and his heart and his hands as he continues to make and see this ministry fulfilled. Lord, thank you for loving us. And as a church, we join together and pray for this ministry. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to ask now if our ushers would come forward. And as they come forward, this is an opportunity that we take every week to give back a portion of that which God has so richly blessed us with. And as they come, I'm going to ask Andrew if he will have our offertory prayer. Let us pray. Father, you loved us all the way to the cross. May we love you enough to give you what is already yours. Bless these tithes and offerings today. We love you. Amen.
Okay, so who here plays a sport? Brinley, what do you play? Levi, what do you play? Ari, tell me about you. Yeah, do y'all like playing sports? Yeah, they're really fun, aren't they? Well, this is volleyball from my eighth grade season, back when I didn't sit bench. And, <laughs> uh, this was from my eighth grade night, so my last volleyball night of the eighth grade before I went to high school. Well, there's a little problem with this volleyball, okay? Whose name is right in the middle of it? You know, it's my name. Yeah, put it right in the center because I thought I was that important. Well, over here we got Aubrey. Aubrey's on the volleyball. But apparently, I didn't think Aubrey was important enough to put her right in the center of the volleyball. So, today we're going to talk about the greatest commandment and the second greatest commandment. So, in your Bibles, it says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replies, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, this volleyball season, this, not I say bench, but I'm still on the team. Um, we did really well. We did. We won the conference, and we won the conference tournament. And we all took a picture, and we held up a number. What number do you think we held up? Not eight. <laughs> We thought we were number one, and we were the greatest thing ever, until the second round of playoffs when we got knocked out. So, how many of you go to the football games Friday night? Because the football games, yeah? What happens when the boys score, score a touchdown? What number do they hold up? One, one, because they think they're number one, right? Okay, well, we're going to talk about that a little bit. I'm going to teach you what the most important rule of your sports is. And you might think that I'm talking about how to hit the ball or how to score a touchdown, but that's not it. What? Yeah, those are great things, though. <laughs> so, I think it's a big problem that we all think we're number one. Because we shouldn't think we're number one. Who should we think is number one? God. Yes. Right? So we should give glory back to God. How many of you have scored a goal in soccer? Yeah? Why do you think we're able to do that? Because Jesus. That is a great point, Lucy. That's right. Because we were able to get up in the morning because God led us. Okay? So this week, we're going to pray that as we go throughout our week that we think that God's number one and we aren't number one. Okay? Let's pray. Dear God, we pray that as we go throughout this week, that we give glory back to you and that um, we help not think of ourselves so highly and that we help, um, that you help us think of you as number one and that you let us guide our lives. Amen. Would you stand as I continue to worship and sing, Come Thou Found?
fly. What did I leave behind? What evidence will future generations have of my existence? Empty rooms? Faded photographs? Dilapidated buildings? Dust and bones and chiseled stone? The scraps of self? The residue of life? The ripples fade and they come to nothing. A footprint, a census, a statistic. Ink drying on a death certificate, filed away and gone forever. But maybe a legacy isn't material. Maybe a person's impact can't be determined by a calculator. Maybe the ripples of our time on the earth, the love we show, the faith we share, the good we do, the people we help. Maybe they go on forever. Maybe they multiply with time until a snowball becomes an avalanche, a drop becomes a flood, a spot, a fire, and a single voice, a tumult, roaring to the universe. But I walk this path. I live this life. I was here. my life 
that's going to make my bucket list before I hit it. So what I want you to think about this morning is your bucket list. And as we go through this, and as we talk a little bit, the bucket and your bucket list. And then there's this interesting thing here. Most of you know what it is. It's odd. It's different than anything you've probably ever seen. It's actually a coffin. It's a legitimate coffin. <coughs> Called the funeral home and said, hey, can I borrow our coffin? Yeah. So I went back. He said, let's see what I got out here. He said, I got this one. It was sitting back on the back wall. He said, as long as I've been here, I don't think this thing's moved. Kind of a good thing when it calls a duck move. I thought, it's really not what I want. I kind of want one of those shiny ones. It's big and, you know, and like everybody sees. And then I thought, man, that's pretty cool. I don't know that I've ever seen one like that. Now, the idea here is pretty, it, what makes it interesting is it's wicker. So when you bury it, what's going to happen? It's going to, yeah, kind of go away. Well, just for information, when you bury you, what's going to happen? You're going to go away. Now, bones happen to lay around sometimes a lot longer than flesh, meat, all that kind of stuff. It depends on a lot of things. A lot of different things depend on how long things stay around. Number one, how long the meat stays around. Hot. Weather. Decomposes a lot quicker than cold weather. But when you think about bones, Interestingly enough, they can last a while. Some have lasted several thousand years that have been preserved well. But guess what those bones aren't doing? Getting up, walking around. That's what we're going to look at in Ezekiel today. The bones. Now, so before we get started... I guess a little um, background would be kind of good. Ezekiel is a prophet. He's an Old Testament prophet. There were several Old Testament prophets. Um, Ezekiel would be one of the major prophets. And with that being said, a prophet was basically, uh, to put it in layman's terms, a preacher. That's what they prophesied. They shared the word of the Lord. Well, my job as a preacher is to share the word of the Lord. That's basically what a prophet is. To share the word of the Lord. But God specifically spoke to Ezekiel in many ways. So what's going on in, in Ezekiel's life, and I'm going to try to do it as quickly as possible. Ezekiel, at the first part of the book, and it's kind of a longer book. Um, Ezekiel, in the first part of the book, he is... Um, he has already joined part of the Israelite nation in a place called Babylon. Okay. Now what's going on? So God created heaven and earth, created man, created um, all these folks, and then the Israelites were his chosen people. Okay? The Israelites kind of couldn't get it right. Sounds kind of us. But they just couldn't get it right. They kept going against the covenant, kept going against the rules or the laws that God put in place to help them live a healthy life. And so, basically, long and short of it, he said, you know what? You're going to be exiled. You're going to be taken away from your homeland. I've given you this land, but because you have gone against me, I'm going to take this land away from you. So, Ezekiel, kind of the first, first flight, ends up over in Babylon. It kind of takes place on the, on the bank of the Nile and Ezekiel has a vision. That's one of Ezekiel's things is he has lots of visions. Has a lot. That's not good. Has lots of visions. And those visions come from the Lord. And in this particular vision, 
He sees the throne of God and, and it's so ornate and it's so built up and there's so many ways in which he describes it there. But what he sees is the throne of God. And guess what the problem is? It's in Babylon. What's the problem there? Where is the throne of God supposed to be? It's supposed to be over the Ark of the Covenant in the temple. In Jerusalem. Well, the problem here, and that's, that's where Ezekiel finally realizes exactly what's going on. And with, with that being said, as Ezekiel's sitting there, here's a cool, uh, maybe not cool, but interesting part, is that this all happens on Ezekiel's 30th birthday. For a priest in those days, that was the magic number. Or for a person to become a priest, you had to be 30 years old. So Ezekiel would have been anointed as a priest on this particular day, but yet he's sitting in Babylon in exile, and the Lord is speaking to him through a vision, and he's saying, guess what? I'm no longer with my people, and that's, that's the bottom line with it. Because my people have sinned against me. My people have turned their backs against me. Ezekiel is then kind of appointed by God in, in a vision. And then he tells Ezekiel through several other ways, he says, you need to tell the folks that Jerusalem is going to be attacked and it will marvel the first attack and be even worse because imminent destruction is upon Jerusalem itself. Destruction now. And the temple. So why is this so important? Well, Jerusalem is home. The temple is where God lives. Or in their vision, that's where they meet God. Well, with all this taken, taken away, then there's a problem. And Ezekiel's sharing this with these folks, and they're not getting it. Later, Ezekiel gets other visions and... Um, he uses what I would call, uh, or somebody else described as, um, well, he uses words to describe what's coming, but he also uses something like street theater. Like he would be on the street and he would use it as a, a teaching moment, a parable, a living parable. And one time he was asked to cut off his hair and he, he did things with his hair. And then another time he posed as the scapegoat. Most of you may or may not know what a scapegoat is, but that's the lamb that they laid on, or the goat that they laid on the altar to take the place of the sins. And so he posed as a scapegoat for an entire year, laying on his side. And as he did so, he ate food that was cooked over dung. And the reason he did that was to say, look, this is what's coming if you don't turn. This is how bad life is going to be if things don't change. Now Ezekiel, you know, a little weird, like most preachers, I reckon. Had to put out some, you know, kind of had to get your attention. But did he really get their attention? Here's the interesting part. In Ezekiel, God told him, in these visions, God told him, they're not going to listen to you. As a preacher, what do you do when God says they're not going to listen to you? You do what the Lord says. You continue to preach. Another vision. He sees idols in the temple. Now I'm talking about real idols. He sees idols in the temple. And he sees the leaders of Israel worshiping these idols in the temple area. He sees women worshiping another idol in the area of the temple. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a problem. There are idols who have infested the temple of God. The question is, have things changed? Chapter 11 is where we are, and I'm going to pick up there. Ezekiel has seen the, these visions. He's prophesied to them, saying, look, guys... You've given up on what you believe. But here's the thing. In chapter 11, there's hope. There's always a word of hope from the Lord. And so, chapter 11, verse 16. Therefore say, 
This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Although I sent them far away among the nations and scattered them among the countries, yet for a little while I have been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Therefore, say, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will gather you from the nations and bring you back from the countries where you have been scattered. That's the exile. And I will give you back the land of Israel again. There's the hope. They will return to it and remove all its vile images and detestable idols. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. They will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. But they must remove the idols. They must remove the images. Anything that is keeping us from worshiping our God and living for Him. Living is the key. Because now we jump to chapter 37. There's a lot that takes place between 11 and 37. But 37 is a really an interesting visual. It talks about living. Verse 1, chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me and He brought me out of the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley and it was full of bones. Dim bones. Dim dry bones. He led me back and forth among them And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. Bones that were very dry. Not just dry, but very dry. A very dry, not not a fresh bone, not fresh, not a bone that still has meat on it. A very dry bone in the middle of the desert. And dry bones become very brittle bones. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? God asked Ezekiel, can these bones live? What would you ask, sir? No, really. Put put yourself in this particular place. God has taken you and put you you around a valley of dry bones. Mountain on one side, mountain on the other side, valley, and it's full of dry bones. And part of the reason may have been Mountains and valleys were where the battles took place. You got one army on this side on the mountain, another army on this side, and what happens? They meet in the valley, and that's where the battles take place. And evidently, whatever battle, and I can tell you what battle this is, it's a battle of will. It's a battle of, I'm not giving up my idols because they are before me, and that's what I choose to worship, and there are a valley of dry bones. God says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? What would you answer? You're looking at them. Ezekiel said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. (laughs) You want to say, good answer. Good answer. Verse 4, then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Verse 7, so I prophesied as was commanded. 
And as I was prophesying, there was a noise. A rattling sound. And the bones came together. Bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them. And skin covered them. But there was no what? Breath in them. Now let me back up for just a second. (laughs) Verse 4. God says, can these bones come alive? I don't know, God. You know the answer to that. Will you prophesy to them? Excuse me? God, you can do it. Why you want me? I mean, you prophesy to them. Honest to goodness, why? What would your answer be? You prophesy to a bunch of dead bones. Okay, God, if you say so. But that's not most of our answers. Most of our answers are like, God, they're dead. There's nothing there. What do you want me to say? But Ezekiel said, all right. So I prophesied, verse 7 says. And there was a noise. And things started to rattle. Now, imagine being Ezekiel. I started prophesying the, the word of the Lord. And all of a sudden, things started to shake. And bones started to come to bones. And then bone on bone, and then a little flesh, and then a, wow, and then all of a sudden they start standing up. But there's a problem. What's the problem? Tell me, what's the problem? No breath. No breath. Hmm. The Hebrew word for spirit and or breath, same thing, ruah. We've talked about it in the last several weeks. The spirit of God, the spirit that lives inside of you, part of that which is your soul, it gives life. And that's what I said. Now we move on. Guess what? Now there is life. Finish reading. Verse 9. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesy. He said, and I commanded, and he's, as he commanded me, and the breath entered them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, he says, prophesy. And say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I am the Lord have spoken and have done it, declares the Lord. Dry bones. What makes dry bones? Dry bones. We all have dry moments in our life. But if you're living in the valley of dry bones, then there is a distance between you and God. God puts flesh in it. God speaks and puts life in it. God's breath is in it. But the problem is, there's dry bones. If there's no celebration, if there's no joy, there are dry bones. If there's no living, there are dry bones. 
I want you to look around and I want you to see here or every other church up and down this road. How many of them are full of dry bones? We go to church, we worship, we pray, we do our daily reading, daily Bible verse. We do all the religious things, but we're sitting here as dry bones because we have not the breath of God in us. And the breath of God is the Spirit of God. And why are we so afraid of the Spirit of God? Because it puts us places we are uncomfortable. We're scared of the Spirit of God. We're all about doing the right thing. Oh, well, let's come to church, let's worship, let's let's do this. But we can come in here and feel good, but as soon as we walk outside, it becomes dry bones again. We are dead men walking. Because the Spirit of God is not alive and well in His church. In His people. And that's the picture of Israel. They had taken so many things and replaced the love and the Spirit of God in their lives with whatever it happens to be. The problem is, it's disobedient. Disobedience creates distance. And distance creates dryness. What would happen? What would the church look like if the Spirit of God was alive and well in the church? I can promise you it would look a whole lot different than it does now. Prophesy over these bones. Say, what? Do you hear the noise rattling? Do you hear the noise coming together? That God is speaking over these dry bones and says, you know what, let's go. Coffin. Dry bones. But without the Spirit of God, it's just dry bones. So the piece of paper you got, yeah, you may want to make a bucket list. But I would challenge you to make a spiritual bucket list. What are the things? If And I don't like to be just morbid. But by the way, when you were born, you began the process of dying. Are you prepared for the next level? Are you prepared for the next step? Is the Spirit of God alive and well in you? Are you listening? Are you following? Are you letting the Spirit speak to you? What's the dry valley of bones in your life? One thing I got to say about that is, if you can identify it, move. Pray that God would allow you to feel His Spirit and His moving and listen. We're all dead men walking. There was a uh, movie that came out a while back. It's one of my one of my favorite movies. And all of them are my favorite movies called The Pirates of the Caribbean. And when I really start watching it, watch. It's all about a a crew on a ship. 
In the sunlight, they look like me and you. When the moon comes out, they're nothing but skeletons. They're dead men walking. And the reason I share that with you is because what happened was, what had happened was, they stole a treasure. And the only, and because they stole this treasure, a curse came upon them. And the only thing that would take the curse away from them was the blood of the captain. The captain couldn't be found. But guess what they identified? Captain's son. And if they could get the blood of the captain's son, the curse would be lifted. Interestingly enough, over 2,000 years ago, the blood of the son of the living God lifted a curse that was put on me and you. A curse because of sin. A barrier. A chasm. But yet, because of the blood of the Son, Jesus Christ, that curse was lifted. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't have to be dry bones. The Spirit of God needs to be alive and well in this place. The Spirit of God needs to be... We don't need to look like this coffin. That's not your bed tonight, I hope. But if it is, are you ready? The Christian life is about obedience, listening and following and loving. And here's the thing, Maggie said it well. Love God, love others. And Maggie didn't come up with that. That's God's instruction for us. In the Old Testament (laughs) and the New Testament. And if we started doing that, the valley of dry bones will begin to live and to walk. And the Spirit of God would live in His church. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the opportunity to look at a moment in our lives to where, God, we're just a a vapor in time. But as we know that we are a vapor, my prayer, Lord, is that you Come and lead us. And my true prayer is that we are open to you doing so. Forgive us, Lord, for being scared of the Spirit. Forgive us, Lord, for being scared of stepping outside of our comfort zone. God, help us to be dancing bones. Full of the Spirit. Your Spirit. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What would your spiritual bucket list be? Who do you need to share the gospel with? What do you need to take out of your life? What is the idol in your life? What is the image in your life that is keeping you from allowing the Spirit To move in your life. We're going to stand and sing. If God's got something that he has laid on your heart. He's ready to fill you with the spirit. Say God I'm ready. I'm ready. Would you move? Would you move? Don't be a valley of dry bones. You've got a decision to make. I'll be down front. Donovan will be here. You can come and pray. The altar is open. Let's stand as we sing.
me say thank you for being here this morning. You got that extra hour of sleep, it made a difference, it looks like. Um, uh, Emily, Rav, that last verse was for you. She is one of those, she says, you know what? Uh, in one version of the, it said, he's gone to prepare a mansion for me. And in one version it says, um, gone to have many rooms, a house for many rooms. She said, I don't want no room, I want my mansion. So that, that last verse was for Ms. Emily. Again, thank you for being here. Senior adults, uh, those of you in prayer partners, your, your list of items to bring for the hospital baskets is in here. Tonight, the youth are at Donovan's. Um, and so please don't forget that. And uh, let's see, uh, if you have um, Christmas child boxes, please start to bring them in so that we can get them to where they need to be so they can go out. Again, thank you very much for being here. Donovan, would you have prayer? Let us pray. Uh, Lord, this morning we recognize, God, that, that it's, it is you that gives us breath. And I pray that we use that breath uh, to bring glory to your name, God, to praise you, and to share that with others, uh, the love that you give us and the love that, that you give them. As we leave here this morning, help us to recognize that, God, that uh, we should use every moment uh, to give glory to you and to share your word in this community. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.